My name is Olivia Plunder and I'm here at MK Gallery in Milton Keynes working on the installation for my exhibition Rise Early, Be Industrious. My approach to making artwork tends to be very historical and I often think of myself as something like a kind of amateur social historian. And what I tend to do is to look at very sort of specific historical moments and then I spend a lot of time in archives and libraries and kind of digging up bits of information. Um, and most of the work is kind of based on that kind of historical research. And there's a few kind of big themes that I've been looking at over the last few years. And I think in this exhibition, um, one of the main themes is to do with education and thinking about different educational models, different attitudes to education over a period of a few hundred years. And then the other kind of theme is to do with the work ethic, which is why the show is titled Rise Early, Be Industrious. There's kind of a historical journey in the show and it starts with the Cube Gallery and the piece Words and Laws, Whose Shoulder to Which Wheel? Question mark. And with that piece, I wanted to look at the, the sort of end of feudalism, kind of medieval times, beginning of modernity. A lot of the sort of images um, are kind of drawn from, you know, kind of early, the early modern period, you know, kind of 17th century, let's say. There's a kind of floor plan in the gallery which is meant to look like some kind of medieval garden, you know, like the sort of garden that you would get in a kind of big country house or something or a big country estate. And then there's a hanging mobile, which, again, it's somehow kind of trying to talk about social hierarchy. And then there's a, a few objects such as we've got a, um, a beehive, which is one of these sort of old fashioned kind of beehives. It looks like something from, you know, really from the past, from the countryside. And every, everything is allegorical, I would say. Um, so the beehive was um, an image that was used a lot in popular printing in the Victorian era. Um, and it was meant to represent the perfect industrial society where everybody knows their place. Everybody knows their place in the hierarchy. Everybody knows what activity they should be pursuing. You know, so it's really this sort of image of the hierarchical society where you have the drones at the bottom, you know, the laborers doing their work, and then you have the queen at the top. There's a couple of sort of satirical comments on stuff that's going on in the political world at the moment. There is a replica of a Stockholm duck house, which was the media symbol for the MP's expenses scandal um, of 2009. So it was owned by a Conservative MP called Peter Vickers, and he um, had put this duck house on his expenses, you know, which, which was kind of one of the, one of the sort of incidents in that, in that whole sort of scandal. Um, and then there's also a little horse, um, which is kind of referring to the, the, you know, the sort of recent incident with David Cameron riding on a police horse owned by Rebecca Brooks, you know, of News International, and sort of somehow referring to that, that recent kind of political scandal. Then the other element in that room that I should mention is all the games. So there's a board game that I made a few years ago called Set Sail for the Levant. Um, and there's also an architecture game, which is very participatory. People can assemble different buildings from, from these kind of very simple blocks. And all the sort of examples that are given in the posters in the room are institutional structures. You know, so you have church, you have school, you have the military academy. And it's these kind of institutional structures from the past, essentially. Um, so again, it's thinking about how we build society. You know, what, what are the institutions that go into building society? What are the elements? You know, how do, how do we participate in this process? And then the board game, um, it's about the land enclosures that happened at the end of, you know, at the end of the kind of feudal era going into the modern era. Um, so the board game has a kind of story in itself. Everybody playing the game, you start off as a peasant and you're kicked off the land because the land is privatised and enclosed. Um, and you have to migrate to the city in order to seek the wage because you no longer have the ability to sustain yourself um, by living off the land. And then there's this kind of little journey. Um, it's a kind of racing game with dice. And there's this kind of journey around the board um, where players kind of increasingly get into debt. Um, you know, occasionally you have the option of sort of making some money and things, prospects improve, but mostly kind of you end up in prison or you end up in the factory or you end up... Um, in debt and the only way you can win the game is by resorting to criminality and stealing all the money of the other players and setting sail for the Levant. Um, 
and the board game, it's based on a 16th century game called the Royal Game of the Goose, which was apparently the first um, racing game of its kind. So it's kind of the prototype for, you know, Monopoly. It would be, would be a sort of contemporary, um, you know, contemporary racing game involving dice that everybody knows, you know. And I'm, with board games, I'm extremely interested in, in thinking about board games as, as stories, thinking about them as kind of an, a narrative format, and then thinking about the kind of political content of board games. So Monopoly is a good example, because Monopoly is obviously about capitalism. It's all about buying property, making money, you know, selling houses, buying and selling property. You know, it's really sort of a teaching tool, teaching people how to exist within a capitalist society, you know. And so my board game is a kind of, you know, in, a, in many ways it's a kind of cheeky comment on that. So the Middle Gallery, it's an installation called The New Jerusalem. Um, and what I'm looking at in there is world's fairs and, as you say, sort of world's fairs as a mass communication, mass education format. Um, and with world's fairs, um, they, it's, it's really a kind of popular format from the 19th and early 20th century. I mean, every, the usual sort of example given of the first world's fair was the Great Exhibition, which I think um, was 1852. Um, 1851, 1852, something like that. I'm looking at, specifically looking at um, an event called the British Empire Exhibition, which happened in 1924. And I'm interested in it partly because it's obviously connected with the history of British colonialism and imperialism. The sort of purpose of the Empire Exhibition, uh, the stated purpose of the Empire Exhibition was to teach people about trading relationships within the empire. Originally, I had imagined that it would be much more cultural as an event. Um, but then when I went down to the archives and actually started sort of looking at what was in the pavilions, you know, you had all these kind of different pavilions, each representing a country that was at that time part of the empire. And then the contents of these pavilions was spe all spectacularizations of trade. So you have some crazy, crazy examples, such as... Um, the Canada Pavilion. At that time, Canada was exporting butter to the UK. So what they had um, to try and talk about this was a huge statue of the Prince of Wales riding a horse, life-size, carved out of butter. Um, and within a kind of, you know, some sort of um, spectacle like that, you know, it says a lot about hierarchy, it says a lot about the colonial relationship between Canada and England at that time, and it's also an attempt to kind of visualise trade. So this space that we're sitting in, um, it's called Open Forum, and in terms of this historical journey, by this point you reach the 20th century, basically, and this it's, is meant to look like a television studio from the 1970s. I've done quite a lot of research into early television, um, and I'm very interested in sort of how television started as part of the democratic project in a sense. The first director general of the BBC, John Reith, he really had this idea that television was going to be a kind of teaching tool to teach these new democratic citizens how to function within this new society which was, you know, of democracy. For this project, I ended up focusing on the Open University because it's based in Milton Keynes for starters. And also the Open University, I think, was a really, really interesting um, project. You know, I mean, it was one of the first attempts in the UK to expand higher education. Um, it was a completely new idea about education through the television, you know, and you have the sort of image of the, you know, the Open University lecturer delivering some lecture on physics or economics, you know, on TV that you might stumble across if you were watching it in the 70s or 80s. I spent a lot of time at the archives at the Open University and you have these kind of amazing programmes from the early 70s which are basically lectures and seminars on TV and then they ask the viewers to participate by writing in um, and then they sort of promise to try and incorporate any comments in the following, you know, the next seminar which would be on TV on a Saturday morning next week. And I was thinking it's... In terms of the structure, it's basically the internet before the internet, you know, what they were sort of trying to do with, with the sort of technology of the time was a model which looks like the contemporary internet, you know, a kind of model of television where you can talk back to the TV, where you're sort of, you know, where you can participate, where your ideas are kind of incorporated into the, into the programmes, you know, the following week or something like that. 
So the foyer area I've called Entrepreneurial Garden and the idea is um, that it's been transformed into a kind of workplace. It's sort of something between a lounge area and a workplace. Um, so it's full of games, you know, again, kind of table football games, all this kind of thing. Um, and the idea is it's something like a contemporary media company. So today you have this new paradigm um, in companies, particularly like Google, um, where the workplace is no longer the sort of heavy hierarchical workplace of the industrial era, but it's this idea of transforming the workplace into somewhere playful, you know. So the workplace um, is now supposed to look like fun, you know, and you're supposed to sort of feel as if you're in a contemporary media company, you're sort of supposed to feel creative and as if you're just hanging out at work with your friends, having ideas. I'm interested in this new paradigm, but I'm also very critical of it because in some ways it seems to respond to the to the sort of protest movements of the 60s, the sort of May 68 student protests, you know, um, and kind of this whole sort of era of calling for more authentic social relations, kind of, you know, desire for a breakdown of, you know, traditional hierarchies, this kind of stuff. Um, but my feeling is very much that um, in reality, um, these kind of working environments and, and nothing of the sort. They're actually kind of a new and subtle um, form of exploitation, you know, because within this in kind of environment, you have a situation where, um, of course, you're still at work, you know. There's somebody, value is being produced. There's somebody making profit out of, out of all your activities there. You're not just being creative for its own sake. And there's this sort of production of what's known as intellectual property. And I think with a company like Google, I'm very interested in how um, that structure is kind of replacing public institutions like the library. So today you Google a subject before you would ever dream of going to a library and looking it up or going to a book and looking it up. So in a sense, Google starts to have a monopoly on knowledge and information, but it's, it's sort of an idea of information as something that's privatized, you know, because within intellectual property, of course, property is the key. Somebody's making a profit out of collecting all this information or, you know, or out of providing all this information. The whole show is very participatory for the most part, you know, so I, I really would like it if people, you know, do use the spaces, do sit down in the conversation pit in the television studio and have a chat, you know, do use the entrepreneurial garden, play the games. I would be really happy if people then think about what participation means and a across a broad range of situations and kind of political structures. So, what, you know, what does it mean to participate in a democracy? You know, what is the nature of that participation? What does it mean um, to use the internet, you know, as to Google something, you know, as a form of participation? What is the difference between, between these? Um, so it's, it's designed to be very kind of playful, you know, and I hope people do sort of find it playful, but it's also a critical look at what the relationship between, you know, at, at this relationship between work and play and how that's changing over time.